Welcome to today's webinar, Bad Data Doesn't Count, Best Practices for Data Maintenance in Sitka's Evergreen. Keeping your data up to date and correct involves a combination of library processes, using Evergreen's features for consistency and regular maintenance, and running reports to track down where data is incorrect or missing. Today, we're gonna to start by talking about collecting data and then look at two examples of where you can adopt best practices on how you collect that data um, that will result in more consistent and correct data. We're gonna start with patron accounts and then we'll look at items. After that, we'll take a look at some reports that you can use to track down data issues, as well as a few interfaces in Evergreen that are designed to help you maintain circulation related data. And to finish, we'll look at our new data management documentation in the best practices section of Sitka's Evergreen Policy and Best Practices Manual, which includes a checklist that you can use in your library and references report templates that you can use to track down incorrect or missing data. And all the reports uh, that I'm gonna talk about today have examples in the reporter definition examples section in the uh, Sitka Manual and have links to those examples from the data management section in the policy manual. So anytime you register a new patron or add a new item, uh, you're adding data to Evergreen. And there's lots of other ways you add data to Evergreen, but we're gonna focus on patrons and items today. That data allows patrons and staff to search your catalog for items, place holds, check out items and more. If the data isn't being collected consistently, then patrons and staff can run into problems. For example, if the wrong circulation modifier gets applied when an item is initially cataloged or it gets missed completely, items aren't gonna follow the expected circulation policy. So let's say you have a policy that allows seven days for a DVD, but a DVD is accidentally given a circulation modifier of book and so instead circulates for 21 days. With patrons, uh, let's say you're a public library and use the patron profile PL new users for new borrowers. You have it set up so that new users can have up to five items at a time. If library staff select PL adult when registering new patrons, that limit isn't gonna be uh, imposed and the account won't expire after three months. So your items and your patrons won't necessarily behave as expected if incorrect data is used. I recommend thinking about what data should be entered when creating items and patrons and making sure it's documented on your end so that staff are consistently filling the same fields and entering the expected values. While you consider this, I also recommend thinking about what data you don't wanna collect. For patron accounts, are there fields that staff simply fill in because the field exists in the patron form? Um, for example, date of birth? Um, or do you actually do something with the data in that field? And the more consistent your data is, the more accurate any statistics you run will be, um, and that can sometimes have an effect on your funding. So Evergreen collects some very useful data that is often used when running those statistics or when trying to figure out what's going on with an item or a patron. So patron profiles allow you to sort your uh, patrons into categories, which vary based on libraries, uh, these profiles also affect how your items circulate. Home library allows you to track where that patron is entitled to library service. This is especially important to any of the BC public libraries as this data is used for your annual surveys to track BC One Card use. So you wanna make sure when you assign a visiting patron, uh, when you, sorry, when you register a visiting patron that you assign them the correct home library. Circulation modifiers are used to categorize your items and are used by Evergreen for both circulation and hold policies. Items with incorrect circulation modifiers or missing the data may not circulate as expected. Shelving locations show your patrons where to go for items and can be used to report on particular collections. If an item has an incorrect shelving location, it may make it harder for your patron or staff to find it um, and it can skew your statistics. Owning library shows which library or branch actually owns the item. Uh, that's going to be more important for multi-branch libraries than single branch. And item status is another piece of data that can cause your patrons problems if it's not correct. If the item is on your mending shelf, but the status in Evergreen is available, 
your a patron and your staff probably aren't going to be able to track that item down. Fixed fields are a big one that affect patron searching. If the coded data in the fixed fields of the mark records, which is the leader, the 007, the 006, uh, sorry, an 008 isn't correct, items don't appear in the filtered search result. We're not going to look any further at fixed fields today, but if you're interested in learning more, we do have a recording on the YouTube channel for Sitka's continuing training webinar, Those Flummoxing Fixed Fields, which goes into that in depth. And then finally, statistical categories allow you to, you to collect information about patrons or items for which there's no specific field in the patron account or item record. And Manitoba libraries should make note of the spruce level Manitoba mun municipality patron stat cap, um, as that one is intended to be used for your annual statistics. So now we're gonna take a look in Evergreen. So let me just switch over here. And I'm just going to exit that slideshow. And here we have uh, the patron account uh, registration form. So the form has lots of fields and most, if not all Sitka libraries only use a subset of them. Um, I suspect nobody has a patron for which every single field in this form is filled in. Fields in yellow are required to be filled in to be able to save the patron. Now, in addition to the fields that Evergreen requires by default, such as barcode, username, uh, patron name, there are some fields that libraries can set as required. Um, and that's, you can do through the library settings editor. So I'm gonna just switch the tab here. And if we go to administration, local administration and library settings editor, and that's just gonna take a moment to load here. Um, and you do need to be a local system administrator to be able to make changes to your settings. So we're gonna start by searching for the word required. And you can see there's several fields here, um, or sorry, several library settings here that allow you to set different fields as required. So Maple Public Library has the date of birth field on the patron registration as required. Uh, doesn't have email set as uh, required um, and has day phone set as required. So there's a few different ones that you can go through and say that you want your staff to be filling those in before they can save the patron account. Now, going back to the patron account, if we click on required fields under this show here, anything that Evergreen or your library has set as required will show, um, but you can also have additional fields show here uh, that display and can be filled in, but aren't required to save the record. And so if we go back to the library settings, this time we're gonna search for uh, show. And you can see there's a number of settings here where you can specify what additional fields show when you're just looking at required fields um, so that staff can choose that in uh, that display when filling out the registration form. Additionally, if we go back to the patron account here, or sorry, patron registration form, uh, there's also the suggested fields option here. And again, using the library settings, if we type in suggest, you can see there's a number of fields that you can say you would like to display when that suggested fields is selected. The last one, if we put an example here, is this shows uh, some settings, if I scroll down here, um, where you can actually put in what format you want as the example for how to enter that data. 
So you can see for Maple here, we've got an example for how a phone number should be entered, um, as well as how a postal code should be entered. And up here, we've got example of how date of birth should be entered. Now, it's really important to note that these settings um, all apply to the patron registration form and the patron edit form in the staff client, as well as the patron self-registration form. Um, so if you have the patron self-registration form enabled so that patrons can register uh, themselves through your public catalog, um, you do want to remember that any changes you make to these settings will affect that form as well. There is a wish list bug for these forms to have separate settings, um, so that's a change we may see in future versions of Evergreen. And I'll just highlight in our documentation, we do have a section on customizing the display fields uh, in the patron account field uh, page um, that lists uh, how to find all of those different settings um, and the different changes that you can make there. So coming back to the registration form, uh, you also, as we scroll down to the bottom, have st uh, patron statistical categories if those are set up. Um, and those can be set to required. And you can see that right now we have this tax area one set to required. If we go to administration, local administration, and patron editor here, sorry, statistical categories, patron editor, here's we, where we have our statistical categories. And if I double click on that tax area one, if I wanted to set it to not be required, I just uncheck the box. I'm going to leave this one as required. Um, you can also see that for this one, we don't have free text as enabled. Um, and if you are collecting information that you want to be able to run reports on, we do encourage you to have free text turned off. Um, what free text does it is, is it allows staff to enter any value in there. Um, so if you're wanting to run reports on this data, it's generally better to have staff picking from your predefined list of values um, rather than adding in uh, any values, because um, then you're going to get a lot of variations on the same thing, which can make reporting hard. So. In addition to knowing what's required for your library um, and what has to be filled in for an account to be saved, um, as I said, it's also important to know what additional information you might collect. Um, so even though you might not always collect an email for your patrons, uh, you likely collect it for lots of your patrons who would like to receive email notifications. So even though it's not a required field, it is a field that uh, your staff should be filling in. Um, and you can see it does show as required on this form. And that's because the hold notices here um, have it selected. So if we uncheck email and phone there, um, the email address field and the default phone number are no longer set as required. Um, but if your patron would like to receive hold notifications by email by default, Evergreen says, okay, that email field is required so that I know where to send the hold notifications. The last thing to look at with the patron account is the main profile permission group. So if I click on here, you can see that Maple has only a subset of the patron profile groups that show in the dropdown. And this prevents staff from accidentally picking a patron profile that your library doesn't use, and it makes the list a lot shorter and easier to work with. Um, if you don't have customization set up for this, you currently see all of the uh, sorry all of the permission groups for all of the different library types in Sitka. Um, around a quarter of libraries currently have this customized for them. So if your library hasn't already had it customized, and you can tell by looking at this dropdown whether it's the full list or um, a subset. Um, so if you don't have it customized and you'd like to, you can submit a ticket to co-op support. Um, we need to know which patron and staff profiles you'd like to have included, and you can specify the order in which they display. So you can see for my public library patrons, um, they're not in alphabetical order. We've got adult, juvenile, and teen at the top of the list because those are the three that are most likely to be picked. Um, so customizing that list can make it a lot easier for staff to work with.
Any questions before we switch over to talking about items? So I'm gonna take us into the holdings editor here. And we're gonna start with circulation modifiers. So circulation modifiers are shared by all Sitka libraries and we currently have 90 of them. So it isn't a short list. Most libraries, I think all libraries, only use a subset of the circulation modifiers in your collections. We strongly recommend maintaining a local list of which circulation modifiers your library uses and what you use the different modifiers for. For example, if you use the circulation modifier equipment for your Library of Things collection and the circulation modifier library equipment for things like headphones or DVD players, make sure you specify that so staff know which circulation modifier to pick when cataloging new items. Um, and if the correct circulation modifier is picked, um, your hold and your circulation policies are going to be applied as expected and your statistics will be accurate. Once you know which circulation modifiers you want to use for your library and your collection, um, we recommend having your catalogers set up or update their holdings templates. And the more holding templates you have, the less likely staff are to pick incorrect values or accidentally leave fields blank. So for Maple here, uh, Maple has a library of things collection where there's different loan durations specified in their circulation policies. Um, to allow for more flexibility in circulation. And I'm actually just going to go into my preferences because I don't have the loan duration uh, option showing. So just going to come in here. We'll add some of these back. And we're going to come back to preferences in a moment as well. So now I have, now I do not have the loan duration. There we go. So I've got some templates set up. So library of things for long duration, for normal duration, and a short duration. And this is something that can be set up in your circulation policies um, if you want to be able to have different durations for uh, items using the same circulation modifier. So we're going to say that this sewing machine that we are cataloging gets a long duration. So we're going to select that template and click Apply. And you can see that it's updated the shelving location it's updated the loan duration, and it's updated the circulation modifier. So you just need to know which template to pick, and it adds all of those parts in for you. And generally, uh, staff would then need to add in an item price and possibly uh, relevant statistical categories. We recommend having one cataloger create all the needed holding templates and then exporting them so that any other catalogers can import the templates. And all you do is you click the export button here, save it either to uh, a shared drive or somewhere on your computer where you can then email the file. And then anyone else who's needing to use that uh, will then import it. Um, and that ensures that all your catalogers are working off the same templates. Now, in addition to the templates, which we popped into very briefly, you can also use the holding preferences to remove item attributes that your library doesn't use so that staff don't accidentally add a value. Uh, one of the tickets that we get every now and then is people running into problems with items that are suddenly asking for deposits uh, for libraries that don't use deposits. And usually what it is, is somebody has accidentally put uh, an amount in the deposit amount item attribute instead of the price because they're side by side, they look very similar. So if we go into preferences here and scroll down, if you don't use deposits at your library, you can uncheck those boxes. If you don't use cost, which is uh, typically used by acquisitions libraries, you can check the box for that one. Uh, if you don't use age based uh, hold protection through your items or floating, um, or the loan duration or fine level variations, you can check all of those. And then if we go back to holdings, you can see it's a much shorter list for your item attributes. Um, and you're uh, less likely to pick a value that you don't intend to um, in one of those item attributes that no longer shows. 
as we saw with the patron stat cats, uh, the item stat cats can also be set as required. So if when cataloging items, you always want the vendor selected, you can uh, go into the statistical categories item editor and set that vendor stat cat to be required. So making these changes helps staff collect more consistent data going forward, but it doesn't actually change anything for your existing items. So let's talk about data cleanup for a few minutes. To start, cleaning up incorrect or missing data can seem like a daunting task. Remember though, it is an ongoing process and it really doesn't need to be done all at once. Your staff and your patrons are using your library and most things are working. Um, cleanup just reduces the number of weird circulation issues, instances where maybe you can't reach a patron because there's no contact information recorded in their account, and it makes your statistics a little more accurate. So there's a report template that you can use called Title and Item Count by Shelving Location and Circulation Modifier that will give you a snapshot of your library's collection and give you a sense of what is needed uh, for cleanup in regards to your items um, with circulation modifiers and shelving locations. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, all of the templates uh, that I'm gonna talk about today are in the reporter definition examples in the Sitka manual and are linked to from the data management section in the policy manual. So I'm just going to switch over here. Here is my uh, report on the current collection of Maple from Monday. And I'm just going to start by clicking on circulation modifier here to sort it by circulation modifier. So we can see that Maple has 10 items that don't have a circulation modifier at all. Um, if we search by shelving location, or sorry, if we sort by shelving location, we can see there's a few things that maybe need to be looked into for that as well. For example, for adult fiction here, we have 72 items that are using the circulation modifier juvenile collection which indicates that there might be something going on, maybe an incorrect circulation modifier, maybe an incorrect shelving location. At a glance, we can also see under DVD, we've got eight items using book, probably using an incorrect circulation modifier. So now that we can see that there's some issues with the data, we need to run some additional reports to be able to see what items are actually involved in that. So there's a report called CERC modifier copies without CERC modifier. And I ran that one to get the 10 items that don't have a circulation modifier. And because there's only 10, what we can do is we can copy the barcode off the report, come back into Evergreen, and I'm just gonna go to cataloging and item status. And I can just scan that item into the item status screen and from the actions menu, I can go to edit and either edit items or edit call numbers and items. And based on the item, uh, I'm gonna say this item should actually have a circulation modifier of book. Gonna click apply, apply all save and exit. And that item now has a circulation modifier. Now with the adult nonfiction that are using juvenile collection, there's 72 of those. So we need that list of all 72, um, which we have here. Now, you probably don't wanna be copying and pasting 72 barcodes or more, but what you can do is you can open this report in a program like Excel you remove all the headings and all the columns except the barcode column. You save the file as a CSV file, and then you upload it into item status. So I'm going to uh, just clear my item status so we're starting from fresh here. Click on choose file, choose that adult fiction or adult nonfiction file that I saved as a CSV. And it is gonna take a moment to load here. So we'll let that uh, work its way in the background. 
and just take a quick look at the report while it's doing that. So if we sort the report by call number, um, we can tell that uh, based on this, it looks like some of these items probably should have the circulation modifier book. Um, this uh, Maple Library uses uh, categories for their call numbers. Uh, we can see we've got, if we go all the way to the bottom here, we've got a number of items that are using a uh, call number of YA. Um, so potentially these items actually should have the juvenile collection shelving, or sorry, uh, circulation modifier. But in this case, maybe the shelving location is wrong. Maybe it shouldn't be adult nonfiction. So if we come back, we can see our file has now loaded and we have all 72 displaying here in item status. Now, what we can do is sort by call number. I'm just gonna click it twice to have it uh, sort by descending. And then I can just check all of the ones that I want to edit. So I'm gonna do all these YA ones. and go to actions. And again, I can edit and edit call numbers and items, or sorry, that's add. So edit uh, items or uh, call numbers and items. And here I can edit all 11 of those in one go. If I look at the list of shelving locations, I find that this library doesn't actually have adult nonfiction. Um, so in this case, probably the call number and the uh, circulation modifier are incorrect. So we're gonna leave this one as adult nonfiction. We're gonna change the circulation modifier to book, apply that. And we're just gonna take the YA portion out, update those call numbers. We're not gonna go through and do all of them, um, but we could and then hit apply all save and exit. And those 11 items are updated. Uh, the item status screen will update the location to show, or sorry, not the location because we didn't change it, but the uh, if we were showing circulation modifier um, and those call numbers I changed uh, will update. It just takes a moment because there are 72 items uh, displaying here and it needs to think through those. Now, it's not a lot of work to select 11 checkboxes, but if you do have a file where you're gonna to wanna to do you know, one thing to 30 of the items and one thing to 40 of the items, what you probably wanna do is actually edit that in Excel, delete the stuff that you don't want included in one of the batches, upload it as its own file, and then go back and upload the other half um, as a separate file, because then uh, you can use the checkbox to select everything and you can batch update in one go. Um, so it can make, uh, uh, with batch editing, it can make fixing items uh, quite quick um, because you don't have to go through and individually change 72 separate items. Now, uh, so that's a few things that you can do for cleaning up pay, uh, items. There's a report you can also run to get a snapshot of your patrons. So this is the current patrons, uh, all of the ones currently in our uh, training server database here for Maple Public Library. Um, you can see there's quite a few different library type, or sorry, patron profiles used. Not all of these are ones that we saw on that customized list. Um, so for Maple, staff need to go in and see what's who's using the patron profiles that the library doesn't actually use. So for example, uh, PL No Finds isn't on the list, the customized list. So if we come back into Evergreen and we go to search, search for patrons, we can pick the profile group here, and you can see this is the whole list that displays in the patron registration form uh, if you don't have that customized list. So we're gonna choose PL No Finds and click search. And we can see our three PL No Finds patrons. We can easily go into their accounts and update their patron profile. This works well when you just have a few patrons doing it through patron search, 
Um, if you have, you know, 50, 60 patrons coming up under a patron profile that you want to see what uh, is going on with that, um, with those numbers, you'd want to run a report. Um, but if it's just a handful of patrons, doing it through the patron search is a lot quicker um, and you have the uh, patron accounts right there to be able to edit. So I know libraries and library staff, you're really busy and a lot of you wear multiple hats and adding another thing to your list can be hard. Um, data cleanup doesn't have to be time consuming and it doesn't need to happen all at once. If you're wanting to move forward and uh, try to clean up some of the data, if you have 10 minutes this month, I recommend setting up the title and item count by shelving location and circulation modifier uh, template as a monthly recurring report. Next month, spend 15 minutes looking through that report and maybe run one additional report based on what you see so you can batch update some items. If that's report, the uh, title and item count is running monthly for you, you can ignore it in months that you don't have time to do anything and take a look at it in months that you do. Um, so hopefully that's a way to, you know, start chipping away at some of this without it being uh, overwhelming. Because I know uh, for some libraries, there are 150, 200 uh, items that are missing their circulation modifiers um, or more. Now, I want to highlight a couple of interfaces in Evergreen that are designed to help you track things that need to be resolved. So if we go to administration and local administration, and we go to hopeless holds, these are holds that cannot be filled by the system. And it's good to check and resolve these holds so that your patrons are gonna get the items that they're looking for or in some cases know that that item isn't something that the library can source for them. Um, there are currently uh, almost 600 hopeless holds across all of Sitka. Um, as of Tuesday, 447 of those are from BC Interlibrary Connect libraries and 68 of them were from Spruce libraries. Um, so. I strongly recommend everybody takes a look, especially though if you are doing Interlibrary Connect, um, taking a look because oftentimes the, the holds that end up on the hopeless holds are either ones that you can cancel because your local something's happened to your local copy and you can replace it as an Interlibrary Connect hold to bring it in, or uh, some of them are copy level holds that have been placed for Interlibrary Connect holds and Evergreen can't fill Interlibrary Connect holds with copy level holds. There's a bug, they just never ever fill. Um, so Interlibrary Connect holds should always be placed as title level holds, unless you're trying to bring in additional copies for something like a book club, um, in which case you should use call number level holds. So uh, when you have a few minutes, good idea to come in, take a look, um, see what holds you can resolve. You might need to decide whether you're going to purchase items for, uh, you know, if something has gone to lost and there's people waiting for it, um, or it may be uh, that you need to contact your patron, let them know you need to bring it in through your provincial uh, interlibrary loan system, uh, a loom or fill, uh, if you're a public library, uh, or it might, as I said, just be something that you're not able to get for your patron. Uh, the other one that's a good idea to look at is if we go back to administration and local administration and into transit list. Uh, this shows, I'm just going to switch the date here so we see some items there. So this shows everything that is in transit to your library. Um, libraries that participate in reciprocal borrowing can use this interface to check for items that have been in transit for an unusually long time. So if you do reciprocal borrowing, you're going to have things on your transit list. But what you want to be checking for is this that this send date time isn't a really long time ago because probably it shouldn't take six months or a year for an item to make its way um, back to you. If you do have ones that are showing with uh, quite old send dates. Um, 
did the item maybe get missed when it got returned to your library and checked in? So maybe it didn't actually get checked in and it's sitting on your shelf uh, just with the in-transit status. Maybe it didn't actually get sent by the other library. Um, it happens. I've pulled a book off a shelf uh, that we thought had been returned to another library uh, and it had accidentally got shelved instead. So if it's not on your shelf, check with the library that's sending it to you. Uh, just make sure they don't still have it by accident or possibly it got lost in the mail. Um, and then I'm not sure what your next steps are for that. Uh, but you may be needing to look at whether or not you're going to replace that item if uh, your patrons will uh, want to use that. Even if your library doesn't do reciprocal borrowing, it's still good to periodically check um, to see if missed scans have sent items into transit, um, because then you can go pull that item off the shelf and just check it back in. Because every now and then uh, a barcode scanner double scans something or there's some really short barcodes, legacy barcodes still out there um, that uh, can get triggered if a barcode scanner only picks up half a barcode. Um, you can also proactively look at the ones that are transits from your library. Um, we don't actually have any for Maple right now, but again, if those have a really old send date and time, maybe you need to take a quick look on your shelf, make sure that item isn't still at your library. And then also in the vein of checking for things that need to be resolved, uh, there's now a template called status, all items with selected item status, which can be used to find items in unavailable statuses, such as missing and lost. And we have that report here. So what I've done is I've run a report that shows me everything at Maple Public Library with a status, a status of damaged, missing, or lost. So staff can now take this uh, report, do a shelf check to see if the lost or the missing items have reappeared. Probably the damaged items aren't actually on the shelf um, and then decide what the next steps are. Maybe the next step is to do nothing and just wait and see if items reappear. Maybe the next step is to decide if you're gonna replace certain items um, or follow up with patrons uh, for lost items. Um, you can run this report with multiple statuses on it, like I've done here. You can also run it with for individual statuses. So you can run it so it's just giving you a list of everything with the status of lost or everything with the status of missing. Um, and you can set those up if you'd like as recurring reports. Maybe every four months you want a report that shows you everything that's missing. Um, and you can then go and take a look and see uh, if any of those have reappeared. Um, and I see a question. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, do you have, um, we were talking about this, like what's the difference between missing and lost in your mind? <laughs> That's a great question. So the <laughs> difference between missing and lost is lost items uh, are were on a patron's account. They were checked out to a patron and the patron has said, they can't find it, or the item has been overdue for so long um, that your automated processes, if you have it set up, have kicked in and set that item to lost. Whereas missing is intended for something that should be in your library, but you can't find. So if a patron comes in and an item is available and you and, and the patron go to the shelf and you cannot find that item, you can then set it to missing because then staff know uh, that it possibly needs to be looked for again. Um, and also your patrons know that it's not something that's currently available. Um, oftentimes, I think missing usually, you know, can sometimes be items just got misshelved. And so they do reappear. Uh, so I saw a thumbs up. So uh, hopefully that answered your question, but it was a great question. So to finish off, I'm just going to pull up here. This is our new data management uh, section under the best, uh, best practices in the policy and best practices manual. Um, this is the first iteration of this uh, section, and I expect that we'll be updating it over time, adding to it, refining to it. Um, if As you're using it, if you have feedback on you know, what works, what doesn't, what you wish you 
uh, was in that section, um, please do let me know. Feedback is always welcome. We really want our resources to work for you. Um, the getting started section outlines what we've roughly looked at today. Uh, figure out what information you collect, document it, set up templates and customizations so that things work better in Evergreen for you, uh, set up recurring reports, and then make sure your staff know how to use interfaces like Hopeless Holds, as well as knowing um, your policies on what data should actually be collected. On the next page here, we have a checklist section. Um, and this lays out things that you can be doing with a recommended time frame. The time frame is really just a rough recommendation because I expect that libraries will do things a little differently from each other. Um, so, you know, for some libraries, you may be running and reviewing reports on a monthly basis. For other libraries, maybe quarterly makes a lot more sense to be looking at uh, a report of items without circulation modifiers, for example. Um, so really, you know, take a look at the list and decide what timeframes actually work uh, and make the most sense for your libraries. Um, under the annual tasks, we have uh, quite a few things that we recommend reviewing on an annual basis. Um, for example, making sure that your library's contact details, uh, so phone, email, address for the library, are up to date in the system. Probably unless you're moving building, your address is not going to be changing. Um, but just, you know, good to make sure that it's up to date in there. Um, same with your hours of operation, especially if uh, you're a library that has different uh, summer and, and winter hours making sure those hours of operation have actually gotten updated in Evergreen um, so that Evergreen knows what days you're open and closed. Um, the other thing that we recommend doing on an annual basis, which is the top of that list there, is entering your known close dates for the coming year. I always recommend doing this in, you know, sometime in December because if you enter all of your close dates, um, especially the statutory holidays that you know you're gonna be closed on, for 2025, this December, I'd include January 1st as well um, for 2026. So you've got that whole, uh, whole chunk of the year done. Um, then Evergreen knows what days you're gonna be closed and the next closure date that's not in your system that's known will be um, in February. So putting those dates in in December ensures that you're not gonna hit a point where your due dates are falling after all of the dates you've already put in. So good to do on an annual basis, um, just to make sure that Evergreen is not gonna assign due dates to days that uh, you know you're not gonna be open. Um, and then we do have a recommendation section uh, with some additional information uh, and a lot of links into the manual for different uh, uh, additional information. For example, uh, here uh, for the main profile and permission uh, groups, if we click on that, that takes us to our brand new section in the main manual um, that shows you how to uh, view your customized list or whether you have a customized list or not, um, and as well, what information we need to change, uh, sorry, what information we need you to send us if you'd like your permission tree changed. Um, and we've also included a list of all of the different profile groups because once you have changed that list, you can always change it again later. So for instance, if you're a public library and you didn't include PL new user in your customized list, but in six months you decide you want to use PL new user, all you need to do is send in a ticket and ask us to add that to the list for you. Um, and you can see, uh, here's the list so you can know what all of your available options are. Um, and the last thing I'll say uh, is we do have a section here on safeguarding your data. Um, looking at both library staff accounts and third-party services. 
Uh, we do recommend uh, making sure that staff accounts get closed if you have staff that leave the library, um, just so you don't have anyone who's not a current staff member who has access to the system. And the same if you cancel a subscription or retire a piece of hardware like a self-check that authenticates through Evergreen, um, please do let us know because then we can remove the accounts that are used for that authentication so that your vendor no longer has access to your patron's information. And that takes us to the end of today's session. I'm going to stop the recording um, and then if there are any additional questions. Thank you for watching this video. For more information, please visit the BC Libraries Cooperative website.